Thank you. Um, maybe I should start with a bit of motivation. Um, the reason for studying conformal field theories, at least in three, potentially four dimensions, is to discover what are the nature of the fixed points of a particular quantum field theory. And in three dimensions, this can be directly related to theories which describe real phenomena in condensed uh, matter physics, potentially, uh, such as, for example, the icing model. And in four dimensions, it will tell you something about the structure of quantum field theories in four dimensions, what happens to them under a normalization group flow, what happens at the ends of that flow, and this is directly relevant, at least in principle, to describing the real world. Now, with supersymmetry, the motivations are much more theoretical. Whether or not supersymmetry occurs in the real world is not the pertinent issue at this point. Um, namely, with supersymmetry, you have much more structure, and you can say a lot more about the nature of the quantum field theory uh, with supersymmetry and its extension to superconformal symmetry. And this gives you much more information and in the way in which we understand uh, the quantum field theories. As a sort of minor illustration, before I go on to the main thing, let me comment on the fact that if we have QCD, um, we have a, a conformal field theory in the infrared, that is the long distance limit, uh, if the number of flavors is bounded above by something like 11 thirds times uh, the number of colors. If we have too many flavors, the, uh, zero, the negative sign of the beta function goes away, and uh, therefore the theory, at least according to conventional wisdom, really is a free theory when you take the cutoff to infinity. Now there's also going to be a lower bound, which is also times the number of colors, and we don't know the number there. This bit is just determined by the ordinary one bit B function, uh, but this bit, um, well the only handle that one has on this is that uh, one can do lattice calculations and so on, so one comes up with rather uh, peculiar number, you know, it's very crude numbers for this, which a lot of work has gone into, but we don't have a very definite value for this number here, even for the simplest theory such as QCD. However, if you extend this to supersymmetry, we know this very precisely because we have a conformal field theory, at least in the large distance limit, when NF is less than or equal to three times the number of colors and bigger than three halves. So this is a free theory. And then what the great uh, discovery of uh, uh, Seiberg in the 1990s was that there's also a free theory at the bottom end. It's not the same theory. It's a theory with additional fields. But these two theories are related to each other by what is nowadays called cyber duality. So that's an example of how the constraints of supersymmetry tell you a lot more uh, than what you know uh, for an ordinary quantum field theory without such additional uh, symmetries. Now let me try and describe what happens when we try to extend the uh, conformal group to include supersymmetry. Now, in the ordinary conformal group, If you approach it algebraically, you have a set of generators So the first ones are what you have in any relativistic quantum field theory, namely uh, Lorentz transformations or rotations and then translations. And now we have these additional generators K and D. Uh, which, uh, so this is dilatations and this is special conformal transformations. And one thing to note here is that, uh, well, I won't write down all the commutation relations again, but basically D tells you what the scale of these, uh, of these generators are. So momentum carries uh, mass or energy, if you like, and so it has eigenvalue plus one, whereas K does the opposite. Now, there are many
many ways of looking at supersymmetry. And uh, so basically, you introduce supercharge. that you have uh, in QCD, beta of G, is going to be something like, uh, well, it's proportional to uh, NC minus, well, possibly the other way around, 11 thirds minus NF, something like that. And, and if G cubed, and if NF is too big, the sign of this reverses and it's positive. So it's only when you, this sign is negative because you want to have a theory in which the beta function does this and then curls around. And uh, at this point here, um, we have a theory which has a, a, a conformal field theory. So this is beta of G against G. And now, as you change the number of flavors, so when this is close to z zero, but still this whole thing a little bit positive, uh, this zero is close to the origin, and you can say something about it. As this becomes larger, the zero moves further and further away, and at some point, uh, effectively, the zero will, will disappear. And the point is that in the real world, NF equal to four, and NC is equal to three is not a theory. Uh, there's, well, there's no IR conformal field. Theory. But were you to be able to increase the number of flavors, there would come a point, but we don't know for what value that would, would be the case. Anyway, the supercharges are in some sense the square root of P. Now, what does that mean? It means that uh, we, well, let's, we have to remember that we introduced gamma matrices, gamma mu, and we also have to introduce spin generators, which well, uh, the sign and the numerical factor here just depends on one's conventions. Basically, this is the uh, right formula in my way of looking at things. And we then have, so here, alpha is going to be a spinner index. plus, and in six dimensions it's minus. So this is something, so there's going to be a dimension dependence in the way uh, 
this um, super algebra is going to work. Now, this of course just gives you ordinary supersymmetry where we have Q's uh, anti commuting to give you the momentum. But correspondingly, one has to extend this to uh, include uh, something to which are going to be the square roots of K. So that we can write, well, SR alpha with S. So at the moment, at least, there's no necessary way to uh, raise the lower indices, so it, it's going to be equal to 2 NRS. And then, uh, well, write it slightly the other way around, times K. So this is the first major step that you have to follow in extending the conformal uh, algebra to uh, the superconformal case, namely that you have to have some Qs which anti-commute to give you the momentum, and then some co corresponding uh, fermionic charges to anti-commute to give you uh, the uh, generator of special conformal transformations, K. And then effectively, this is all you have. You don't have to bring in any more operators than what we've already just written down. And in consequence, we know straight away what many of the commutators can be, namely, well, because this has to have a half in order to be consistent with this being plus one there. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, I, you, yeah, I should have, yeah, you're, you're right, of course, I, <laughs> I'm jumping the gun slightly, you need to have the uh, R symmetry stuff, yeah, yeah, okay, so what I mean to say is that we don't need any more uh, generators which have the Lorentz type indices, okay, you're, you're perfectly right, uh, and then we also have D with S, R, R. To minus a half times S. And then because the Q's and the S's have spinorial indices, then they must have some rotation properties, which I'll only describe slightly schematically. That uh, M with Q is going to be S times Q. And M with S. So this is going to be S mu nu. Uh, it's going to be similarly S times S. So it's pretty easy to write down what the relevant forms are. And the important point here is that the D's here are things which basically all the generators that you have in the algebra have some eigenvalue under uh, so we can then essentially write down what some of the other commutators can be because there's only a sort of pretty P mu with uh, S gamma beta is going to be, uh, let's say, N S. So here we are raising. Uh, So P increases the eigenvalue of D by plus 1, so here we have something with eigenvalue minus a half, and on the right hand side we have something with eigenvalue plus a half, and then it's basically the only thing that you can write there. And if you work out what the uh, P, K, and Q, so there's a way which, the sort of brute force way of doing this is to start writing down commutators and then try to verify the Jacobi identity. I mean, uh, it's not the most sophisticated way to derive the form of an algebra, but it's the way in which, at least for some of us, leads to more understanding than you would. Uh, so the point is that if you take uh, minus k p with q, then according to the Jacobi identity, P with K. 
So the point is that we more or less need to check that this is true, and all that this requires when you go through it is that NRT NTS is equal to delta. So that's all perfectly uh, consistent. Uh, what becomes slightly more non-trivial is when you start to consider the Jacobi identities involving two of the um, of the supercharges. So if we consider this, so the point here is that we want to make this. Uh, quantity here. We know what S with S is because it's determined from, uh, so this, this will then in principle give you, so this will tell you uh, something about the behavior of S with Q. Because when you commute P with S, uh, it gives you a Q. S with S gives you a K, so you know the commutator here. So you can then work out what the form of the commutator of uh, Q with S is going to be. So here, I'll write it down with the details. So these are supercharges, so we have an anti-commutation there. And, well, this has got to be something which has eigenvalue uh, zero when you commute with D. So the things which can appear on the right hand side are basically M and D. So uh, this is going to be minus 2 S mu. Well, the exact coefficients which appear here are determined by the Jeffrey identity. Minus But now we can add on a new term, namely something which is involves the internal symmetry. So the coefficient 4 here is, in essence, perfectly arbitrary. We can choose whatever coefficient you like. The coefficients which appear here and here are determined by consistency with the algebra. And then we have some generator RT. So this is some generator of transformations on the, uh, let's say, TS. And of course, for this to be a consistent algebra, we will have to have, uh, later on, R with R uh, is equal to R. Uh, with some precise details, but which, which one needs to work out. Okay, so, uh, and then this is what's commonly called R symmetry. So we haven't finished the game as yet, uh, playing with water identities and so on. Uh, sorry, with Jacobi identities, I should have said. Uh, because it's also necessary to consider one more set of Jacobi identities, namely the ones which occur, let's say, for Q with S, commuted with S, or correspondingly, Q with S, with Q. There's more or less a symmetry in this problem between uh, Q and S and P and K, at least at the algebraic level, so if we can satisfy this particular relation, uh, then you more or less automatically satisfy that one at the same time. Now this is where the non-trivial constraints come in. So this implies restrictions on D. So rather than go through this in any detail, um, if I write this up, I'll try to put the detailed argument through. Uh, but we find that there's only solutions in specific cases. Let me exclude d equal to 2 because that's somewhat special. I've already said that the conformal 
group is special in two dimensions. So let's consider the following case if d is equal to 3. Well, the possibilities that you can have are just those cases. There are no superconformal theories, at least within the framework which I've been describing in dimensions more than six dimensions, because basically you have to assume certain identities when you couple, let's say, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. But there are some completeness relations here which only work in this number of dimensions. And let me describe what are the specific theories that you can have in those cases. So what is the R symmetry group you can have? So let me, uh, so in this case we can have ON. Here we can have U of N for N not equal to 4. Uh, it's SU4 otherwise, and there's a definite difference there. Here we can have SU2. And um, here we can have SB. The six dimensional case, I mean, basically, uh, in this case, uh, we have NRS equal to delta Rs. And in this case, because the gamma matrices are essentially anti-symmetric, NRS is equal to omega Rs, which is equal to minus omega SI. The point is that for the symplectic groups are ones for which there is an anti-symmetric tensor which is preserved and uh, so these are basically all the theories that you're interested in. And then normally, for, you want there to be less than 32 supercharges. So, uh, for interesting theories, so this restricts you and this to n less than or equal to 8, n less than or equal to 4. Um, and in this case, uh, n less than two. So these are the full set of superconformal theories that one can uh, consider. And now, because we are, now remember that when I started talking about um, the states of a conformal field theory, so. states or the representative of the CFT, you start from some set of states phi and these are primary states, conformal primary states if they're annihilated by phi, uh, they have some eigenvalue Uh, and then they also have m on phi is equal to some spin. So what I mean by spin here is I mean a bunch of matrices under which these states transform in such a way as to have the right algebra. Now in the context, and if you do that, then all the states... <coughs> so the descendants are given by products of keys acting on phi. And in some cases, if a descendant is primary, happen in special cases uh, that uh, we can set it to zero. T 
to get a shortened representation. Well, there are various cases you can consider, but the one example I gave was that we can set p squared phi equal to zero if delta is equal to d minus two and it spins. Uh, there are other situations which correspond to conserved currents. Now that all these basic ideas extend to the superconformal case, namely that we can have a superconformal primary if S on the state phi is equal to zero. Namely, the point is that because S is in some sense the square root of K, if K annihilates the state, we should expect S to annihilate it as well. And then it satisfies, uh, and then the sort of the, the descendants uh, then in, include terms which involve products of Q's and also of P's acting on the state line. So we generate the set of all possible states by forming multiple products of Q's. Uh, there can only be a finite number of these because, uh, well, I mean, some of the Qs will generate Ps and so on. So there is then a superconformal multiple. And again, we can have some shortening conditions if some of these descendants are also superconformal primaries. So this is an algebraic problem. So if the descendants are superconformal primary, we can set these to zero. In general, this is only possible for particular deltas. For delta uh, determined. So if we have such a shortened multiple, uh, the delta is restricted uh, and it can't get uh, corrections when you do some kind of perturbative calculation. So this is uh, the basic framework of dealing with superconformal symmetry. Now let me specialize a bit just to four dimensions and explain how it works there. So uh, maybe you can do this in uh, any of the dimensions for which uh, superconformal theories work, but I guess the case which has been worked out in most detail is the case for the to four. So, so far my framework has been more or less general the thing is that each of these R symmetry groups are different in different theories. So really, at this point, one has to do a case-by-case -case analysis. I don't think that there is a sort of encompassing theory which considers all these different dimensions at the same time. One just looks at each one and follows a similar kind of strategy in each case. So in d equal to 4, Um, it's convenient here to consider, well, in terms of gamma matrices, we can have sigma mu alpha dot alpha and then sigma bar mu alpha dot alpha, where these are indistinguishable, take two values. I mean, in, in the d equal to 4 case, Basically, everything has got a complex structure. And we can write that mu mu is 
is replaced by M alpha beta and M uh, beta dot alpha dot. Where notice there are, there are six objects here uh, because we have the condition that M alpha alpha is zero. There are three here and three here. So we have the same number of potential generators and we then well, I mean, it's convenient. So these generate an SU2 algebra. And as a matrix, in terms of, you can write it as J, J, J plus, J minus, and minus J. And similarly, this thing, we have two SU2s. So you can write it as J plus bar, sorry, J3 bar. So J3 and J plus and J minus obey the usual uh, angular momentum commutation relations that you have uh, in ordinary uh, angular momentum theory. And then, well, in this case, the Q's go through Q and Q bar. And so we have indices, let's write it as QI alpha with Q bar. J alpha dot is equal to 2 count I D alpha. So that's the basic supersymmetry algebra expressed in this two component spinner language. And there is the corresponding algebra Corresponding commutation for the two S's. So uh, we have that S bar I alpha dot with S J uh, beta dot is equal to 2 K uh, alpha bar. So the point is that we can replace any vector, so any V mu can be replaced by a V uh, alpha dot alpha or a V alpha. So you can just encode any vector in terms of a two by two matrix uh, with spinner indices. So uh, let me just write down uh, one more commutation relation of S bar I alpha dot with Q bar J beta dot. So that so this is the one which I uh, wrote down in more general terms on the top of the right hand board. Uh, but in this particular case, this is going to be four. The numerical factors of four are matters of basic convention. So. various points in this you have to make some assumptions as to the normalizations of things. Hopefully my assumptions are consistent. And then we have this additional term involving the R symmetry channel. Uh, time R. So most of the other commutators and anti-commutators are perfectly straightforward, but let me just write down one more, namely, what is the commutation relation of this generator of our symmetry with, let's say, uh, the uh, Q? Now what appears here is determined by consistency with the overall algebra. So this has to be delta Kj Qi uh, gamma. So the R charges don't affect any of the, uh, it's, it's a Lorentz scalar. And when we have minus a quarter, 
Josh and I, Jane, cube uh, KM. And there are similar ones. Now, the point here to note is that this quarter is determined. So we can impose our I, I is equal to zero only if the right hand side vanishes, and that's only the case if I uh, goes from one up to four. So it's in the case when n is equal to four that this uh, becomes a generator of SU4. But other cases where the, um, we have the indices, let's say, going from one to two, uh, we still have to have a quarter here, uh, and so that means that RII is non-zero in that case, and therefore we have uh, the internal, the, this generates uh, a U2 symmetry rather than an SU4, rather than an SU2 symmetry. But now let me, the analysis that one can make depends on the value of N now, but the basic ideas are rather similar. So let me describe the simplest case. Now let's consider n is equal to 1. So the, we can just basically drop the indices. Uh, i and j, just replace this by 1 uh, all the time. In fact, it's slightly more convenient to uh, write Rij to minus 3 quarters times R. That minus 3 quarters is of no fundamental significance. It's just there that to get the normalization uh, of the kind which is uh, more conventional in the literature. So uh, it doesn't have to be that way, but nevertheless it's what I want to do in order to make things more conventional. So if that's the case, uh, the basic algebra, well, I'll just write the commutation relation S bar alpha dot with Q bar beta dot is equal to 4 M bar alpha dot beta dot minus 2 delta alpha dot beta dot. And then plus 3 halves. I think, uh, yeah, 3 halves. So, I mean, I'm at liberty to choose the scale of R uh, in this case. So, the, this factor, three halves, has been chosen just by choosing the scale of R in an appropriate fashion. Now, let's examine. So, the multiplets that we want to consider are those which are annihilated by. So, we want to consider multiplets which are annihilated by. S alpha, let's say, psi, and S bar. So this is necessary in order to have a superconformal parameter. But now let's suppose that we want to impose additional constraints on this. Well, one of the simplest constraints that we could consider is to impose the condition that q bar alpha dot on the side is equal to zero. Oh, I should have put in a d there. Now, if that's the case, then because of this commutation relation here, we must have the m bar alpha dot beta dot on side is equal to zero, and also that we have to have that two d on side is equal to three r. Uh, maybe I've got my num numerical coefficients wrong. Uh, just, just check a moment. Yeah, I think actually I should have had a three there. Yeah, it's, 3 is correct because uh, there's an overall 4 there, and then I chose this factor of minus 3 quarters in the changing the normalization. 
Now, the point is that the value of r takes eigenvalues little r, and this has values, uh, eigenvalues delta, so this is equal to 3 over 2. So, this, so getting that coefficient 3 over 2 is why I chose the normalization in the way that I did. And so this determines the value of the scale dimension in terms of what the R charge is. And this only works if uh, this is, uh, so there are two SU2s. So their value representations are determined by two J. So J for the uh, M, so the J bar for the M bars. And this has to be the case of J bar. Zero. So, Sorry? I guess I disagree that these are SL2s. Well, SU2, SL2s if you prefer. I, <laughs> I mean, I'm using the physicist's language that SU2 and SL2 are the same. It depends when you impose some. I know it's technically wrong, but nevertheless. So, uh, the problem is that. You really only have SU2 if I can say that J plus dagger is equal to J minus. No, no, well, I agree. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, I, I, it's a slight uh, euphemism or a misuse of language to call these SU2s. But insofar that I want to construct representations which are finite dimensional, all the textbook stuff of raising and lowering operators. I mean, you start from a state uh, j plus on j is equal to zero, and then you play j minus to the n on j uh, gives you all the states, but when n is equal to 2 j plus 1, you get zero. There's a non unitary representation. I, I agree that a purist would not like to call these SU2s. Um, somebody who's sort of rather non-purist, like myself, who tends to call them SU2s. However, uh, be that as it may, it doesn't change the results that you rep and So in four dimensions, the, the spin labels are J and J bar, and this only works uh, for J bar is equal to zero. So this is what's called a short multiple, or a BPS multiple. Half BPS. Uh, it's half BPS because of all the supercharges you have, namely the Qs and the Q bars, half of them are killing the state. Uh, no, but now I'm going to try and describe a multiple which is not as uh, constrained as that one, but still obeys a short weak condition. So, so one of the things you would like to do in the case of conformal algebra is to analyze what are the possible uh, multiplets which are constrained in various ways. Now in the case of n equals 1, which is what we're describing here, uh, it's relatively simple. In the case of n equals 4, there are lots of different possibilities because you can have, there are basically 16 uh, q's and q bars. So there's q alpha uh, i and q bar alpha dot. And if these indices i take four values and these take two values, there are 16 such supercharges. And you can have conditions in which somewhere between 1 16th and a half of the supercharges are now at stake, all of which you need to analyze separately. And that becomes slightly tedious, though maybe perfectly straightforward. But in this case, there's only one other situation to consider. So I want to consider what is now often called a semi short uh, supermultiple. So, over there, I considered previously the short case with q bar alpha dot was essentially put equal to zero, acting on the states of the theory. 
So I'm now going to consider a situation in which uh, basically q bar 1 goes to 0. So only one of the supercharges goes to 0. One has to be slightly clever about doing this because otherwise there would be two inconsistencies. But let's consider a state psi which satisfies the condition that j plus bar is equal to 0. Uh, and it's characterized by uh, spin labels, J and J bar. So in this situation here, in order to get this condition, we had to impose J bar is equal to zero. In this case here, I'm going to consider a situation where J bar will be allowed to be zero. Now let's analyze uh, the following state. Namely, let's consider Q1 bar plus 1 over 2 J bar uh, Q plus uh, sorry, Q2 Now what I can show is first of all that uh, we can show that J plus bar on this state let's call this psi prime uh, is equal to zero. Uh, so the point is that, and then further, so this psi prime, so none of these states will change the eigenvalue of j, but it will change the eigenvalue of j bar. Uh, so this is a state which has spin labels j, j bar minus one. Um, so it's definite spin. And then one can try to work out what happens if you act on this with S2. Now remember that we have the S2 on psi is equal to zero because I'm assuming that the original state is a superconformal primary. And then if we just work through the commutation relation, so the point is you need to anti-commute this through the Q1, you have to anti-commute it through here. It already anti-commutes with this thing here. So that what you get at the end is equal to 4 plus uh, 1 over 2j bar times uh, minus 4 j3 bar. So this is what you get by anti-commuting it through here, minus 2d uh, plus 3r times, and then everything is times uh, j minus 1. So the question is, is this equal to zero? It's equal to zero if the scale dimension and the angular momentum here satisfy a certain condition. So we have that S2 bar on psi prime is equal to zero if it's the case that delta is equal to uh, 2j bar plus uh, 2, 3 over 2. So this is an example of a uh, shortened multiplet in which delta is further determined. Well, I can replace this by little, I should say. So the point in here is determined by r and also by the spin here. But in this case, only a quarter of the supercharges are zero. So this can be called a quarter BPS. So I don't just set Q1 bar on the state to be zero. I have to add this contribution in as well in order to satisfy this condition to make it a spin 
state. So in general, when you're analyzing superconformal theories and you're looking at uh, their properties, you have to consider uh, both sh short and semi-short super, super multiplets. And the shortened super multiplets are protected in the sense that their scale dimensions are determined. In the case of n equals 1, the R charges can take more or less any value, but in the higher end, n equals 2 and 4, where the R symmetry groups are U2 and SU4, then for these rare shortened supermultiplets, the scale dimensions are determined in terms of the relevant representations of these groups. And uh, in those particular cases, uh, the deltas are fixed. Uh, and so if any particular uh, theory, such as n equals 4 uh, supersymmetric gauge theories, uh, they have both the short supermultiplets, super semi-short supermultiplets, as well as what are called long multiplets. Long multiplets, there's no constraint on delta, and this can take uh, values more or less anything you like from the point of view of um, the basic algebra. I should say that in general, uh, if you want to impose conditions like unitarity, these become lower bands, and it's when you reach the lower band you can have a semi-short uh, supermultiple. So I think I'll finish these lectures here. Let me just say that, in my view, that there's still a lot to be done in terms of understanding conformal field theories in three dimensions, four dimensions, and possibly higher dimensions. Uh, we're still at the stage where it's more botany than classification. We're sort of pre-Linnaeus, if you like. I mean, we know quite a few conformal field theories in three and four dimensions, but we don't, as far as I'm aware, have a very good understanding of all the possible conformal field theories. In two dimensions, at least in some cases, for minimal models, we know pretty much all the conformal field theories which exist. There is, as far as I know, no notion of what we mean by a minimal conformal field theory in higher than two dimensions. Perhaps you will disagree with me then as well. <laughs> but uh, that would be a challenge. Whether this is a mathematical challenge, probably it is, but whether or not it, it can be addressed by physical methods is another matter as well. But I think there's plenty of scope for further research, and some of which, at least in three dimensions and possibly four dimensions, are directly relevant. I mean, one of the um, motivations I know by Slava Richkov and Ricardo Ritanzi, when four or five years ago they uh, re looked at the conformal bootstrap, <coughs> was to try and find theories which have large anomalous scale dimensions. If you have large anomalous scale dimensions, then the ideas of naturalness, which are based on ordinary dimensional power counting, may no longer be valid. And one of the problems that one has at the present time in our understanding of the way theory works, insofar that supersymmetry, at least at low energies, hasn't been discovered, is that ideas of naturalness seem to be uh, not always applicable uh, to understanding how the quantum field theory works. And one way in which this could be sort of understood better if there were operators which had large anomalous dimensions. In fact, the kind of bounds which uh, Slava Richkov and Ricardo Ritazzi and others have found tend to say that you cannot have large anomalous dimensions, at least in the theories that they were considering. Uh, and then this tends to preclude the possibility that you can have theories in which naturalness takes a rather different perspective. But maybe uh, there are ways in which, in some theories at least, you can have conformal field theories with dimensions which are quite a long way away from those which you would expect on the basis of free field theory. In those class of theories, standard notions of naturalness would not be applicable. And that might be a motivation for trying to study this kind of thing further. But anyway, thank you for your uh, attendance and your concentration.